Good evening, everybody. I'd like to thank you for attending this webinar. Uh, my name is Simon Ramshaw. I'm Managing Director of Aconia Lasers Limited, and we're uh, the UK, uh, Europe and Middle East subsidiaries for Aconia Corporation in the US. I'd like to thank you for your time. I know it's late for some and you will have either had your tea and rushed through it or you'll be having your dinner after uh, after this webinar. Um, very important message we're hoping to deliver from these educational webinars. Um, I'll introduce Dr. Rob in a minute, but I've been lucky enough to know Rob since 2012. <clears throat> He's uh, got a clinic in Middleton in County Cork, and they've been using uh, non-thermal low-level lasers in the practice for a variety of things for over eight years now. Um, one thing Dr. Rob will tell you is he's very big into his science, into his research, and so are Aconia, so it's a very good fit. Uh, we started 1996, we got our first US FDA clearance in 2002, and now we hold 18 of the 21 FDA clearances given to low-level laser. And all of our studies are placebo-controlled, double-blind, randomized, multi-center studies. Uh, which, when you look at research these days, it's pretty much the top that you can get. Before I introduce you to Dr. Rob, I just would like to tell everybody, if they look down the right-hand side column, uh, they'll see a questions uh, icon. Uh, any questions you've got, uh, both Rob and I and Julie in the background will be looking at them, and um, we'll uh, Rob will either answer them during his presentation or we will wait to the end. So. Without further ado, Dr. Rob, over to you. Thank you, Simon. <clears throat> Evening, everybody. I'm going to um, talk to you about lasers in a second. Let me just get everything back to where it should be. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you this evening about the scientific underpinning of lasers. And I'm kind of doing this backwards. Um, I'm starting off and we're going to really talk about non-thermal low-level laser and we're going to talk about the applications of that. In the next lecture, which is going to be on Monday the, the 15th, we're going to look at the differences between devices. Uh, so we're going to look at hot lasers, we're going to look at class 4, class 2, and we're also going to look at LED and that sort of thing. Uh, and then in the, the final presentation, we're going to tie that all together. Each of the presentations that I'm doing, I'm going, I have got case studies in because I don't want this to get to be just boring science. Um, in this uh, presentation this evening too, there is a video about electromagnetic energy transfer. What's that got to do with lasers? Well, let's find out. Uh, so I've broken this lecture down into sections. So the first thing we're going to look at really is the principles of the whole concept of photobiomodulation and whether or not these non-thermal low-level devices fit into that. Um, personally, I don't think they do. It's for each of us to draw our conclusions onto that. Then what I'd like to do is look at what we think we know about health, what we think we know about our cells and the way our cells age, and how that applies to pretty much every medical intervention we make. So whether I'm a chiropractor doing an adjustment, whether I am an aesthetics doctor basically using a fillers or a, or a Botox technique, or whether I'm using something uh, more in, invasive than that, it, it's even relevant to if I'm a podiatrist, if I'm a physiotherapist, it really doesn't matter what discipline you're coming from. So it's basically having a look at what we think we know in relation to the this type of technology. We're going to spend a little bit of time then looking at why non-thermal low-level lasers, what makes that laser so special, what makes it so different, and really it comes down to the way that that works in terms of energy transfer. Then I want to look at a concept really that beauty is something that isn't just skin deep. How that applies to the scientific underpinning of low-level lasers is pretty much all of the science that we know in terms of lasers comes out of this whole concept of what lies underneath the skin. So we're gonna take a little bit of a look at that. And then we're gonna look at the positive effects that each of 
the wavelengths that this particular technology around the cornea uses. So that's basically looking at your violet 405, your green 532, and your 635. So we're, we're really cramming a lot into the evening and some of the things we'll only touch on and we'll get further into those pretty much in the other lectures. Conclusions. I really like everybody to draw their own conclusions. The conclusions I make may be relevant to me, they may not be relevant to you. Uh, so please feel free to make your own conclusions and even to question mine. So what do we know? Uh, we know that basically photobiomodulation is a form of non-ionizing light therapy. It's something that kind of encapsulates a lot of things including lasers, low-level lasers, more thermal lasers, light-emitting diodes, and it even goes looking at broadband light, which we we're talking about the infrared spectrum. So it's a collection of devices. Some of these devices do fit well together, some of them don't in terms of their operation, and that's what we're going to really concentrate on with these three lectures. So we're working with something that comes from the electromagnetic energy spectrum. And when we talk about lasers and when we talk about light, we're dealing with a very, very narrow part of that spectrum. We're dealing with visible light, which for our purposes here is really between 400 and 7 nanometers uh, of, of, of light. So photobiomodulation is reported in the literature very much to be a non-thermal process. The reason I put those in red is because it's reported to be non-thermal. Some of the lasers that are coming out these days as non-thermal lasers actually produce heat and they cause quite a lot of discomfort. Traditionally, the low-level non-thermal true laser uh, basically would have been used in the alleviation of pain, inflammation. It works in immunology in terms of producing uh, a good immune response, helping assisted immune responses, especially in HIV treatments. Then we're actually going to look at it in terms of wound healing because a lot of lasers have been used in wound healing. And a lot of the wound healing that we see, we're now bringing across from animal models into human models. So quite a lot that we can do with these devices. So when we look at the visual light spectrum, this is basically what we're talking about. And pretty much Aconia lasers fit into uh, pretty much all of these areas. We don't have a yellow one yet, we don't have um, an orange one yet, and we definitely don't have a cayenne one yet, but uh, we're getting there. Just haven't found out what it's going to be used for yet. So the basic principles that under, underpin all of this is that it's, it's a laser uh, or a light or a light source that basically is relatively straightforward to use and doesn't have any negative side effects and is reported to have no damage at all and it doesn't impair tissue function either and that basically includes nerve tissue and the response of this light within the body this non-thermal low-level laser the response really is to repair and to heal and this is a response which is mediated through the mitochondria and the mitochondria have always, I suppose, traditionally been viewed as the powerhouse of the cell, which is quite interesting because they're not. They are more than that. They are far, far, far more important than that. So the end point of this action is really to reduce pain, reduce inflammation, uh, basically emulsify fat, et cetera, and accelerate healing. Just an interesting point on the mitochondria um, when you look at the mitochondria within the cell wall or within the cell or wherever you look at it, the mitochondria always looks like it's a separate cell in itself. And in this, an interesting point is when we go back to the evolution of this planet and we go back to millions and millions and millions of years to when there wasn't really any oxygen on the planet, most of what lived on the planet was anaerobic. And the byproduct of, of that anaerobicity was to produce oxygen. And basically, the production of that oxygen meant that it was toxic to this anaerobic lifestyle. And pretty much what happened was you had the formation of anaerobic bacteria. And that aerobic bacteria basically 
in time became part of that anaerobic culture and became integrated into that cell. And you got a symbiotic relationship, which basically meant that oxygen was now usable by this anaerobic uh, microbe. Lots of videos about that. I was going to put one online this evening about it, but unfortunately I haven't had time to sort out the copyright issues on that. So. Uh, we can look at that uh, in the future. So non-thermal low-level laser used to be called cold laser. Um, again, it's a laser that is always cold. We have a difference sometimes as well with lasers because if we look at class two lasers, a class two laser, it doesn't matter what I do to it, it doesn't have a target, it's going to be cold. If we move up the level and go to class four, we can have a laser that is potentially cold but that can also be hot. With cold lasers and non-thermal lasers, that isn't the case. It will always be that. So if you're watching the presentation, you'll see that uh, the references are coming up at the bottom, and you'll be able to go have a look at those because Julie will send you out the, the presentation. Laser's primary target is a chromophore within the mitochondria called cytochrome C, and this is basically um, a photoreceptor. Um, it responds to the light which is coming in or the energy of that light. So if you think of a laser beam, a true laser beam is columnated monochromatic unidirectional and what that basically does is it delivers energy along that beam into the system. That energy or that light energy is collected by the chromophore or cytochrome C and converted into energy and that basically creates the electron transport that we want to have which is the responsible mechanism uh, for the change that these lasers bring about. And possibly uh, the mitochondria is, is more important than we thought. A lot of research nowadays uh, basically talks about research in terms of signaling, in terms of hormone balancing, in, in terms of mitigation between other systems. It also talks about it being an intra and extracellular uh, mechanism for transmission of information. And I think the most recent research of that done last year basically uh, tells us a lot more about the mitochondria in terms of aches, pains, wrinkles, bones that creak, uh, teeth that fall out, hair that doesn't grow. So basically we've got something there which is far more than the powerhouse of the cell. And if you look at the references coming up on the bottom of the screen, you'll see that there is stuff there that's well worth reading and relevant in terms of when it was produced. So when we think about the mitochondria, what we have to think is, is it possible that our body has everything it needs for a happy life? The only thing that's missing sometimes is the inspiration for that to function. I'd pretty much like to hold that thought in terms of, is it the inspiration to function? Because this is where non-thermal low-level lasers come in. So, what I'm trying to do this evening with you is build a picture for um, the use of non-thermal low-level lasers. What we will do in the next lecture then is, is, is look at these devices in relation to each other. But in order to do that, I'd like first of all to get an understanding of what we know about low-level lasers, how it works, and why that's so important. So let's have a look at the research. If we do a literature review, which we all had to do in college and some of us still have to do, I find them extremely exciting. I know my students found them extremely boring, but um, we all have our peculiarities. So in this presentation, pretty much we're focusing on six in terms of research, in terms of what we know lasers do and do not do. So the general agreement on the six papers that I've used, and I'll cite them later, is that the mitochondria can in no way be viewed as that simple energetic factory. But instead of that, we have to start looking at it as a platform for intracellular and extracellular signaling. It's also something that regulates our innate immunity, and it basically modulates the activity of stem cells. And when we look at what's going on in the world at the moment, you know, we talk about we talk about vaccines and we talk about mRNA vaccines. You know, we're talking about mitochondrial RNA vaccines, which is an expression of DNA. So again, you can begin to see that there could possibly be a future argument uh, for the use of lasers to inspire cellular function, uh, especially in terms of how the mitochondria might regulate the whole 
um, aspect of cellular aging and the effects that that cellular aging has on us in terms of disease. So aging leads, as we know, to many profound effects, not just in tissues of the body, but also in our muscles and in our hair loss and all of the accompanied impaired functions that happen as a result of growing old. And all of us, it doesn't matter what we're doing, all of us have jobs because of the cellular aging. If cells didn't age, I wouldn't have a job as a reconstructive orthopedic podiatrist. My colleagues upstairs wouldn't have a job as chiropractors and the rest of my team here who work in physiotherapy and other things, they wouldn't have a job as well. So cellular aging, although uncomfortable, it's vitally important to the way that we as practitioners live our lives. So here at the bottom, you'll see some of the references to what we're saying. Again, you can go check them out. So all of science has always struggled to explain aging. Some of us will say it's an evolutionary base. Some of us will say it's a base triggered uh, by particular uh, events. And then others will say, no, it's just basically the way that things are. But I think really one of the most important people for me in terms of this whole aging thing was Madawa. And Peter Madawa was um, a Nobel Prize winner. He is considered to be the father of modern transplant surgery because of some of the things that he could do with the genicity of people. A guy worth well worth a guy well worth researching into and looking at what he says. Gonna look at his hypothesis in, in a minute. Another guy that I think is really excellent in terms of understanding what happens to our bodies as we grow older is Tom Kirkwood, who is up in Simon's neck of the woods in the university up there. And we're going to have a quick look, too, at his disposable soma theory in terms of concept of aging. What has this got to do with lasers? I can hear you all asking. It's got more than you think, and I promise I will tie it together shortly. So, Madawa, his hypothesis on the aging of mammals. I could talk about this all night. I think this guy is absolutely great. It's well worth to go Google this guy, look at some of the YouTube stuff, look at some of the, the stuff that's out there. Um, basically, in a nutshell, Madawa's hypothesis was we are programmed in a way to age, but that program is started by a cellular event. And that cellular event, ladies and gentlemen, is sex. We are here to propagate the species. And we get to a certain stage in our life where our bodies are maintained in this perfect physical physique that we are attractive to the opposite species, some of us. And what basically happens then is we procreate. And at that act of procreation, our bodies say, finally, done what he was meant to do. So now basically our cells change and we start to go into decline and we lose this, this, this somic energy potential. So that's basically a Madawa in a nutshell. Kirkwood, on the other hand, looks at this whole thing of disposable somic energy. So he's looking at stem cells, he's looking at uh, thalamies and, and, and all of these things. And when he looks at those, he's looking at the profound effect they have again, based on the influences of, um, of Madawa. So again, a lot of research out there, relatively recent on cellular mechanisms within stomach cell aging. Stomach cells are brilliant things because they haven't got a clue what they're supposed to be, and suddenly they become what they're needed to be as a response of movement, cellular signaling, or other actions within the body. What's that got to do with lasers? Quite a lot, it's very important. And then we look at basically immune remodeling as something which happens as a result of aging. So we've got to the stage of procreation and now we start to go into our decline. So basically our immune system changes as a response to that and we can get specific immunity or what I like to call immune aging. Uh, and again, very relevant. I threw this one in about gray hair because fortunately I don't have it. I shave all of mine off because I tend to be more, be more bald. But this is one of the things that science has never really got to explain. What happens? Why do we go gray? Haven't got a laser to fix that yet, but hopefully there's one coming along somewhere. And again, we can look at basically the whole sort of 
event of what happens with stem cells and stem cells basically in this repair process, which is what that paper is about. I'm always going to come back to Madawa. Madawa's hypothesis is very interesting because it depends on the idea that the evolutionary importance of an in individual in a non-aging population declines with calendar age and therefore natural selection allows for existence of progressive more um, traits with age up to and including death and old age. So what he's basically saying there is that once this event has taken place in terms of I have done what I'm programmed to do in life, then basically we get that decline. So what's that got to do with lasers? Almost there, guys. The mitochondrial basis of aging is very important. When I was teaching, we always used to teach that the mitochondria was the powerhouse of the cell. Now we know that it's far, far more than and what we basically know it's in the box there is a decline in in mitochondrial quality in mitochondrial activity and a decline in mitochondrial numbers is basically something that's associated with normal aging and because of that mitochondrial decline we develop a wide range of age related diseases but not only that in terms of beauty is skin deep the cells inside which hold up the skin on the outside basically don't do their job as effectively because of lack of mitochondria. If only we had a way to increase this viable mitochondria, we could change a lot of things. So when we take that last statement into account, if you think about it, when we're young, we obviously have lots of mitochondria because they're saying there they decline with age. So basically, possibly no structure is, is really so intimately linked and connected to both energy of youth and the decline of age. When we're young, we have bucket loads of them. When we're old, we don't have so many buckets. We just have, well, we don't have so many mitochondria. mitochondria. We might have the buckets. So then if we look at some of the recent stuff, we look at Neo Sonnet Al, and he basically goes on to say that the revolution or the revelation of the complex antagonistic functions of mitochondria has transformed the way we look at them. So, you know, not just the powerhouse of the cell, then we start to understand things better. So what about mitochondrial function? The relevance of mitochondrial function in, in aging and aging related processes, nothing really knew about that. Uh, but during aging, we see an accompanying decline in the mitochondrial function, as we've said, and this further contributes really to what goes on with aging. So basically, lack of function, change of appearance, um, different sort of tissue viability issues, different sort of, I suppose, mutations within cells and within the, the mutations themselves. And all of that basically contributes to these mutations which increase with frequency and age, and also the levels and kinds of mutations that appear within the tissues themselves. If only we could affect that mitochondrial function, what could we do in relation to these conditions? Again, all of the references are there on the bottom, well worth a look. So, Pretty much everything that we're talking about leads to this one event, and this one event is basically inflammation. Uh, so the inflammation that we get is one of the hallmarks of aging. And as we are growing older, we get this basically low-grade inflammation. Again, I'm calling this inflammaging. And what's it characterized by? It's characterized by an increase in the circulatory inflammatory biomarkers. Uh, such as interleukin-6 C-reactive proteins. We now know that it's not just interleukin-6, it's 10, it's 9, it's 15, it's 12, 17, etc. as well. We know that we get enhanced age-dependent immune response. Now, that sounds good, doesn't it? Enhanced age-dependent immune response. And what we basically think that's saying is we're getting better immunity, but it isn't. What it's saying is we get enhanced immunity, which can specifically look at one particular thing at a time. So while our immunity is over here quite happily looking at something and fixing it, the very thing that's going to knock us out is down here happily munching away. 
again, we get that loss of mitochondrial DNA synthesis. So if we could increase the viable number of mitochondrial DNA, as all of these papers have said, what would be a, we be able to do? And then we get impairment of stem cell process. And we even get to the stage where we don't produce that many stem cells at all, and a lot more. And again, another paper which speaks to that, you will get a copy of the presentation, so you will be able to download these papers just by clicking on them, and the links will come up. So all of this brings us to the whole concept of cellular aging and dysfunction, and it brings us to the whole concept of methylation. Is methylation something good or is methylation something bad? Basically, in my opinion, it's something that's both good and bad because we need it for so much. We need it for differentiation, we need it for regulation, we need it for uh, specialization. And it's not so good for the very, very same reasons. If we don't have the differentiation, the regulation, and the specification within the system, then the system goes into decline and we die. Why? Because of lack of mitochondrial DNA. So mitochondria decrease with age. The more we have, the better our energy levels, the longer we're able to control this differentiation, regulation, and specification process which basically slows ultimately our cellular aging. This is one of my favorite slides because this is basically the mitochondrial genome. 16.5 kilobytes of information storage. And if you think about that and the computers that you're watching this presentation on, they don't come close to that. So when we look at all of this storage, all of this potential energy, what can we do to make things better? And for those of you who love to go into the science of this like I do, it's all there, not going to go into it now, but feel free to go into it at some stage in the future when you get the presentation. So now we're at the bit where you can take a deep breath and say, oh, thank God he's nearly got there now. So why non-thermal low-level lasers? We know from the research that I've presented to you that mitochondria uh, and other cells, their activity decrease with age. We know that non-thermal laser increases the viable number of mitochondria, papers are cited there. And we know that non-thermal laser has a beneficial global effect on the body. And that's very important. So laser light, really could be looked at as a drug with no adverse reactions. And why am I saying that? If, if you think about a drug, take a simple drug, paracetamol. What does paracetamol do? It recognizes and reacts with molecular receptors. The laser does that. The non-thermal low-level laser does that. It doesn't matter whose laser it is. If it's non-thermal and it's low-level, it's going to do this. So it's reacting with cytochrome C. So it recognizes and reacts with molecular receptors. Activates secondary cascades within cells. Uh, the laser does that because basically it's taking biphosphate and it's turning it into triphosphate. Uh, so now we have the beginning of electron transport and the cascade which goes with that, which is free nitric oxide, H2O2 reactive oxygen species, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Any one of them alone is not good. Put the three of them together in combination, and you have something that has an extremely beneficial effect on the functioning of the body, the expression of basically the mitochondrial DNA. And also, drugs do what? They affect cellular behavior and function. The laser does that by upregulation of genes. So I can hear you all think, hang on again, upregulation? We can't upregulate anything. Doesn't the body basically turn something else on to basically balance something up? That's what we thought. But basically, when we look at new research, which was basically done, we know that this laser function will upregulate genic processes, and that's your anti-inflammatory response. So it also manages cellular action. So when we look at the positive effects of these things, we have to basically think what's happening. The laser beam 
is delivering electromagnetic energy into the mitochondria of the cell. The laser beam having deposited that energy because it doesn't have a target continues out into the energetic universe. The hertz of light delivered by these beams is very much absorbed by cytochrome C, opsines, and other photoreceptors within the cells of the mitochondria. And here you're looking at the screen with a list of all of the things that change as a result of that laser activity. The interesting thing about this is this is a paper that was written on the biological effects of low-level lasers in a country where they relied on them heavily because of the lack of drugs. So what I'm going to talk to you about now is non-thermal low-level lasers as a device for delivering um, electromagnetic energy. I'm going to play you a video for this. And when I've played the video, I'll come back, talk to you some more. Just give me a few seconds to get my screen right after the video stops playing. So just coming back to you there, guys, let me get you my screen back. So the reason I have played that video for you is because we're talking about electromagnetic energy and as you saw from that video, it's basically telling us that the wavelength, the laser beam, the nanometers, the wave beam, uh, the wavelength, that's passing all of the way through. 
and the energy is pretty much being absorbed by the matter, in this case, the body, the cells, etc. And that, that's very, very important because in the unit that we're going to do on the 15th, we're actually going to start talking in that about thermal lasers. And a lot of us will hear the laser isn't very good because it's not delivering so many joules per square centimeter, etc. The reason for showing you this video now is a non-thermal laser is not reliant on joules per square centimeter. A non-thermal laser is using a laser beam, which as you saw from the video, passes all of the way through the wavelength. And that delivers that energy into the matter, in this case, which is the body. Uh, so that's very, very important. So where do we use non-thermal lasers? Non-thermal lasers are used in lots and lots of areas. They're used in fat cell management. So fat cell management is important because fat is not bad. Fat, if you have some like I do, that's the meal you ate two years ago and didn't exercise properly after. Wouldn't it be great if we could have the benefit of that meal that we ate back there? So instead of having this fat sitting there, I can use a laser to convert that fat into energy to feed my muscles and give me the benefit of that 40 euro meal or that 550 takeaway that I had five or six years ago. So how do we apply that? We can apply that to body sculpting, weight management, cellulite management. We can use it in pre-obesity and diabetes management. And if you take a pre-obese patient who's pre-diabetic, and you use these lasers and get some sense into them, you can actually stop that diabetic outcome. We also use them in obesity management. In the clinics here, we use lasers a lot in pain management. We use both of those frequencies there. So they're nanometers. So if you remember wave lengths, they're measured in meters. In this case, because it's so small, they're me measured in nanometers. So the areas there in pain management, again, will be neurology, neuropathic pain, and pretty much all categories of pain, because I can lecture you about nociceptive pain, I can lecture you about visceral pain, I can lecture you about all sorts of categories of pain. Your body knows nothing about that. All of your body knows is, oh God, that hurts. That's all your body knows. All the laser knows is, I can deliver energy. I'm going to deliver energy in there. All you need to do is employ your skills to use that energy to activate mechanisms to treat those conditions and pains. So neurological management, the kind of things that these lasers can be worked in, and we have research for it, is Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, ADD, autism, stroke. Uh, in physiotherapy and rehabilitation medicine, we can use it for prehabilitation and rehabilitation. And that's very important um, because prehab is great. If we wait until an injury strikes, then we're, we basically um, have to treat that injury as an injury. But what about if we were to be proactive for that and say, okay, we know this guy gets, let's say, I don't know, um, Achilles tendinopathy, uh, why does he get that? Because there's tightness in the gastrocnemia, soleus plantaris, how are we going to fix that? We can use a non-thermal low-level laser to basically activate special movements within that muscle, special transport within that muscle to lubricate that muscle before that person goes out. The result of that is the muscle is pre-warmed, the akin, the uh, ability then to, end, to uh, activate the tendinopathy is, is far, far less. So that's how we would use it in prehabilitation. We can use a 405 nanometer laser in diagnostics. Uh, we can do videos on these at another webinar in the future just to show you how to use them. Uh, other areas include skin tightening, um, aesthetic dermatology, general dermatology. We can use it in dermatophyte management in podiatry. Uh, so we can use it for mycosis of the nails. We can use it for fungal infections of the feet and hands. And basically we're talking about a modality which is safe and effective with no recorded side effects or negative events throughout history. 
and I know that's a fact because every Friday I troll the databases looking to see if we've had adverse events. And from the time Mester designed or utilized this first in Simon Weiss University back in the 60s, no recorded side effects. So for me, in my practice, these lasers are great because I took an oath and my oath was, first of all, to do no harm. I now have a technology that adheres to that oath that I took. So limits to non-thermal lasers, I don't know of any. I think the limits are basically how we utilize it and how we think about it. So basically, it has no limits to the possibilities that it can do. Research, of course, is the key, and courage within clinical practice to use them is important. So I'm going to come back, we're nearly done, I'm going to come back to the point there. Does our, is it possible our body has everything we need for a happy, healthy life? All it needs is the inspiration to function. Is it possible that this non-thermal low-level laser, in its ability to activate through magnetic energy transfer or electromagnetic energy transfer, activate, infuse, and allow our bodies to expressly produce this mitochondrial DNA? So let's look at a, a case study. This uh, is, is one of my, my victims. Um, he's a runner. He's 28 years of age, or he was at the time. I think he's probably 31 now. And uh, he came to us with plantar fasciitis because we're a reconstructive orthopedic podiatry center uh, here in Ireland. So he'd had plantar fasciitis. Uh, it had been present for more than 20 weeks. That's a long time. It's a lot of pain. He'd had shockwave. He had had steroidal injections 10 weeks prior. I didn't do that. Um, he had used anti-inflammatory gels. And basically, when we look at plantar fasciitis, we, we know from the research that it's a common cause of heel pain. It affects all types of people, heavy ones, skinny ones, active ones, not so active ones. And it's believed to be the result of chronic stress or repetitive overload. We also now know that there can be a degenerative link uh, within this as well. So on his evaluation, he basically had tightness to the Achilles. Uh, there was tenderness over the anterior medial heel. Basically, we all know what Achilles tendonitis is. And if you look at the screen there, you'll see the, the functions that we, we checked and his VAS score. So VAS is visual analog scale. And that's basically how much does this hurt from one to 10, 10 being the most. He had a nine. So always with any good diagnosis, and we all do it, we have a differential, what could it else could it be? So there on that side of your screen there, you can see the things that it could possibly be. So the rationale for treatment, um, I developed with Aconia a standard based protocol. And this is your starting point for using um, their lasers, any cold laser. And the starting thing really is through uh, dermatomes. So the set-based protocol that we use would be dermatome-specific, it would be movement-driven, and it would be then the area of discomfort. So what that basically means for this guy, if you look at the diagram there, it's an Achilles um, problem, so plantar fasciitis. So it's affecting the Achilles and it's affecting the plantar apronus. So in terms of a dermatome, that's an L4S51 dermatome. So our first port of call is to put the laser on that dermatome while the patient is doing movement. So that movement can be plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, inversion, eversion, flexion, contraction of the knee, etc. And then we go to the area of discomfort. So basically, plantar fasciitis in this instance was treated with a red laser. Um, as you can see there, it was moved up and down over the nerve root or the dermatome for two minutes. And uh, basically, while that was happening, we were getting the person to activate with slow movements, as I have said. And then basically, we went to the area uh, where the pain was, as well as the associated muscles. So the outcome with that was, it was the standard protocol, which we would use here, which was six sessions. The sessions take up to 15 minutes. We always review the patient at two, six, and 10 weeks afterwards. 
And basically when we're doing studies, we would follow that up at 12 and 18 months. So this patient completed six sessions as we had asked him to. He returned to normal function. There was a review point uh, for him at three weeks. The follow-up was done at 12 and 18 months, at which time he hadn't had the recurrence of any symptoms. The only other thing we did with this guy was we gave him a decent pair of orthotics, something that were made uh, for him, uh, the old fashioned way, not using a force plate. Uh, and then basically we gave him some proper exercises and stretches. So, and a lot of the time it's, it, we have to treat every patient as an individual. Um, it's very, very difficult to say how many treatments somebody needs. I think in terms of the clinic here, we always work with a set number of treatments. It was six, it's now eight. So everybody will do eight treatments. The clinician has the right to stop that at any time and the patient has the right to ask for more. Uh, so basically, sometimes we would talk about maintenance as well. So when we look at conclusions, based on the evidence, really, when we think about it, the mitochondria is actually so important because if we can have more mitochondria, we can regain some of that energy of youth. If we can regain some of that energy of youth, then basically we can have the repair functions of that. We can have the anti-inflammatory functions of that uh, and everything that goes with that. So there isn't really any negative in the employment of a non-thermal um, low-level laser. And I'm going to come back to that thing. Is it possible really that our bodies do have everything we need uh, for a happy, healthy life? The only thing that's missing is that inspiration. Could that inspiration possibly be this non-thermal low-level laser? So just so that we remember what this is, low-level laser is basically light amplification by the stimulated emissions of radiation. So when we go back to uh, the video that I showed you earlier, what we have to think about there is they were talking about stimulation and expression. This is the stimulation. This is the expression. I have hopefully bored you enough for the evening. Um, I will happily take any questions that you may have. Yeah, should. thank you very much for that, Rob. Um, doesn't appear to be any questions at the minute, but you know, you raised some very valid points and points that we will keep repeating and reiterating as time goes on. Uh, we came across a situation again today where um, somebody thought that they had a laser, but it was actually an LED. So you know, it's only through education delivered by the likes of yourself that will cover a lot of these grey areas and give people and clinicians and doctors a true understanding as to the technology they're getting. And then, you know, nobody's saying they have to go down this route, but at least they'll have a solid understanding as to what's out there. So thanks a lot. Thanks very much for that. I, I think really what I've done this evening is I have covered um, non-thermal low-level laser. What I really want to do next week and what we will do next week is we're going to look at why non-thermal over thermal, et cetera, et cetera. While I was doing some reading for this this afternoon, Madower is one of these guys that I really like. And um, I, I came across this quote from Madower, which I think is very, very nice. It says, the human mind treats a new idea the same way as the body treats a strange protein. It often rejects it. <laughs> I like that. Yes, I like that as well. Yeah, yeah. So if there's any questions, great. If not, uh, you guys can just email them into Aconia and I will answer any questions you have. If you want to talk to me, um, talk to Julie or Simon in the office, I'm quite happy for you to uh, contact me via WhatsApp or any other medium you would like to use. There's a couple come in there, Rob, which um, is just from, from uh, Michael across in Switzerland, who's just bought an EVRL laser. Just to say thank you, um, Ruby is asking, will we be able to see a demonstration of the laser? Have you oh, got your I think, for example? 
I can give you a demonstration of anything you want. Um, like I, I, I'm terrible. I use my laser on me um, every day. And I think the biggest thing that people worry about at the moment is how can I get my immune system up? I mean, this is the winter for, for most of us and we are subject to the seasonal nasties, you know, these colds and flus and all of these things that are running around. Uh, I suffer quite badly with asthma. Um, since I've been doing what I'm going to show you now, I haven't. So I'm just going to show you something that I do to me uh, in order to boost my immunity. Uh, so this is just a very quick, uh, simple immunity boosting program. So here's my laser. I'm going to go into my protocol mode up here. I'm going to go into my user mode here. And I've got something there that says brain. Um, that's because I'm not sure if I have one. So I take this and I put it to the back of my head here, shake it up and down like that for about 20 seconds. Then I'm basically taking this and I'm putting it up my nose because I breathe through my nose and you can see the red light is going all the way through. Then basically I'm gonna turn it around to here and treat the other side because I don't know if you can see it maybe on my tunic, no. Maybe on my mask, no, let's see. There is a violet um, light here. Ah, yes, see on the white square, you can see the violet. So the reason I am changing it over basically is to get that on both sides. Then I'm gonna pick up my vagus nerve and I'm gonna follow it down here. And I'm gonna follow it down towards my gut because of my gut brain axis. I'm gonna do the same on the other side follow it down to my gut brain axis. Then I'm basically gonna hit my throat, same as my back of my head. And pretty much mm. that's all I do. If I've been quick and I've got any time left, I comb my beautiful hair with it. And uh, that is how I protect myself with a laser every day uh, from the seasonal nasties. Can we do demonstrations? You guys tell me what you want me to do, and we'll do an extra webinar, and we'll just go through the things you want demonstrated. <laughs> so you want a demonstration with Achilles tendinopathy, we do that. You want a demonstration with asthma, we can do that. You want a demonstration after we've done a procedure, I can do a procedure, and we can video the laser after that. So just let us know what you want to see. Happy to show you. Yeah, thanks for that, Rob. Uh, that's the EVRL laser that Rob was demonstrating there, which is pretty much the most multifunctional one that we have. Um, used a lot on just general pain management, um, accelerated healing. It's antimicrobial as well, so it's used a lot in dermatology. Uh, there's a US FDA clearance for acne there as well. So even though Rob demonstrated the EVRL on immunity, uh, pretty much every laser that we have, there's a protocol that we can do on that. Even the emerald, which we use, which is FDA cleared for, uh, circumferential reduction up to 40 BMI. So um, it's harnessing the the um, the uh, various different lights to uh, show different multifunctional um, on some um, some rather interesting studies in the US, uh, which I can't share too much about at the minute because it involves getting an FDA clearance. But you know, there's so much we can actually do with it. This is the big one. The FX635 that Rob's got. Yep. That's the FX. So. We would use this frequently for um, brain work. Uh, we would do a lot of neurological stuff here. Uh, so we would use that for brain work. Uh, we would use it in rehab and prehab. Um, like we have a laser, every, every room has a laser. Like I can't, I can't work without them. Uh, like we took these lasers into our clinic in the last recession. Uh, and I can safely say if it wasn't for what we do and what I learned with these devices, I wouldn't be talking to you now. Um, we have not closed throughout the COVID crisis because we are considered to be an essential clinic in terms of what we do here. Uh, and all of our patients basically come to us every day. Like today, the clinic here, uh, we've had four rooms going and we have seen 152 patients today, all socially distanced, all managed. 
every single one of them had a laser boost before they went. So we started at half past seven this morning. It's uh, half past seven, almost half past seven again now. So 12 hour days. So really these devices do have an important role to play uh, in, in clinical care. So whether I'm doing a fillers, a Botox or whatever, I'm still going to use this device to activate the body's functions around that. Yeah, thanks, Rob. I, I think a lot more research that we're doing as a company as well during this whole COVID situation is pointing to the fact that a lot of patients will be uh, looking for uh, treatments that uh, if they can combine health and wellness with whatever they're specifically used for, um, and we have the the emerald laser, uh, which we've launched pretty uh, well only recently um, into the medical aesthetic industry. And I think in that industry as well, I think patients will be looking at things differently. So you know, we very much look at you know what we're doing to the inside of the body just as much as the outside. Um, and if we can make those patients actually feel better on the inside when they're leaving the clinic, um, that will give them the uh, the confidence, I think, to uh, to have a nicer and, and more healthier life. Um, Sasha saying, very interesting, Rob, thank you very much. Michael saying, what is the clinical re relevance of the frequency? Um, I, I think we have to, it's it's in the next lecture um, uh, anyway, but ju just briefly, our bodies will respond to different lights. You know, you go out in the sun, you get sunburnt if you don't put on sunblock. Um, you sit in, in a room like this with the light on all day, you're not going to get sunburned because the frequency is, is different. Uh, so if, if you think about, let, let, let's take violet. Violet is a very energetic wave. So it's, it's a very, very energetic waveform. Uh, so that is going to have affinities to particular types of tissue. Uh, so in the next lecture, we're, we're really going to look at this. If you think of red, red is a, is a more lazy frequency. And then if you think of green, it's kind of an in-between frequency. So the, the, the clinical relevance really is, if I'm going to work with neurological tissue, of preference, I will want something that's blue because that's going to be quite energetic for the nerve and it's going to raise that axionic potential. But I also need to feed that nerve in terms of that potential, in terms of that energy. So I'm using the red for that because the red is going to bring me blood supply. It's going to bring me lymphatic movement. It's going to bring me muscular movement. It's going to create hyaluronic acid, et cetera, et cetera. So when you combine the two together, it's having a specific function. Now, when you take the relevance of green, green has a very, very, very strong affinity to lipids and prolipids and fats. Uh, so it's very good in, in the management of, of, of fat cell conditions, fatty conditions. It's very good when it comes to skin toning. But having said that, violet is also very good for skin toning. So each of the lasers will have a particular affinity. So if I want to work with, with collagens or let's say I have a, a, what's it called, cellulite, if I want to work with that, I need to reprocess and reprofile my collagen. A green laser will have a far, far faster effect at doing that than a red laser will. So the clinical relevance there lends towards the green, mm. not the red. If I'm working with the brain, am I going to put a green on that? At the moment, until I've done research with it, no, I'm not, because my brain is mostly fat and cholesterol. I don't have too many brain cells as disease. I don't want to put too much green on it, just in case I end up with the same brains as Simon. Then really, we're all in deep trouble. But yeah, they, they do have a clinical relevance. But I think, forget thinking too much about clinical re re relevance and start thinking about delivery system. So the laser is a delivery system, uh, just the same way as... If I want to um, give one of my patients um, an anesthetic or something, I need the product. I need the applicator for the product, and I need the delivery system. So if you start thinking laser is made up of all of these things, but the most important part of that is this needle because that's the delivery system. So the clinical relevance really of, of, of the nanometers is important insofar as 
it allows me a slightly different delivery. Um, but start thinking of the, the frequencies and the wavelengths as delivery systems that allow me to deliver the energy that I want to a particular substance within the body. So rather than thinking of clinical relevance, maybe think of clinical substance. Yeah, it's a good Make response. Sense? Yep, completely. Um, just have a look further down. Uh, are they very expensive? I mean, I, I suppose being the, the MD of the company, you know, we want to make the lasers as affordable as possible as what we can, especially in these hard times. So, you know, we have some specific um, creative financial packages on at the minute to make the lasers affordable. So we'd be more than happy to send you um, send you the information. Um, I'm lucky enough, I suppose, to see, you know, across Europe and the Middle East, the impact that the lasers can have, not just for aesthetically, for example, on, on fat, um, but also on pain. And, and, and Rob himself tells stories about amputations that he would have had to make if it wasn't for the lasers. Um, but, you know, it, it's a big education. And this is why Rob broke his lecture up into three phases. It's all uh, a process and we'll carry on to educate. And the education sells itself. Um, one thing that we always guarantee is that everything we say is backed up by this solid clinical evidence. Um, and that's important in something when I used to be a consultant, I used to advise clinics on what technologies to buy. It's very important that you do your due diligence um, because there are a lot of good sales reps out there. And uh, unfortunately, everything they say isn't always backed up by solid clinical evidence. So hence why, you know, we've got the 18 FDA clearances and they're all placebo controlled, double blind, randomized, multi-center studies. And we'll, we'll carry on to do that. We keep pushing the boundaries. We keep getting new clearances for new protocols because we want to improve what we're currently doing. Um, and yeah, I, I think through the help of doctors like Rob and, and some of the other ones we're, we're getting around Europe, we very much have a family mentality. So you know, we like to stick together. We like to share stories. Um, it doesn't matter as well how good the laser is without the necessary levels of training and support. You're never going to optimize the performance of the laser and what you can do with it. So that's just as important. And I know Rob, myself, we, I suppose, get demented by all the WhatsApp groups. We must probably have about 300, um, if that, but we like to be there for our customers. And especially when you first start, it's a learning curve for everybody, so um, you will be getting the, the necessary levels of uh, of that training. Um, I, I think back to back to the point you made, Simon. I mean, like if you're squeamish, you can turn away from the screen. But this is um, something that was done back in in November of last year, and normally th this would have been amputated. So this guy came in basically off a motorbike. Um, I'm going to show you his foot and, and the state that that was in. And this should be considerably more swollen and in a worse state than it was. We stuck um, an FX on this for an hour before the surgery. And like this is the, the kind of um, thing now that that would have in the past been more of, a, of an amputational thing. I mean, other things that I wouldn't have attempted in the past would be we wouldn't have reconstructed that uh, because of the vascular supply. But I mean, there's a lot of things from a surgical point of view that you can actually do with this. So really, it's a case of thinking, if you're going to put a device like this into your clinic, how does it fit? Um, that's where I come in because I'm there to talk to you. And, you know, at the end of our discussion, we may say, look, this, th this device isn't what you need. So, I mean, I think the difference of my experience with Aconia is they're not there to give you something you don't want and sell you something just because it's a good idea we're there to make sure that you get the best possible use out of the investment that you make and unfortunately um if you buy yeah. something you're stuck with me <laughs> no we, we're all very lucky to have you uh rob and the experiences that you share with us on a day-to-day -day basis and you know that's the platform we're building from um there's a message coming about the fx being portable the portable lasers tend to be um these ones, we have stands that they fit into, but depends on what treatment you're doing because you might be combining a range of motion with it, which means nine times out of 10, you'll be doing a manual treatment. But as Rob said, if you're trying to do a, a brain treatment or something more standard, the laser will fit into a stand 
and you basically just press start and uh, and, and let it go. The FX, I mean, it's we transport it around because we have a lot of congresses to go to, so it is transportable, but you know, it, it, it depends within, again, how far you wanting to take it. Like within a clinical setting, it's portable. Like I can take it from any one of my rooms to any one of my rooms. So it's portable in terms of it's clinically portable within my within my clinic. Um, but it's 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 a little bit of a pain um, if you want to take it to another clinic. Um, like for me at this stage, if I want to take it to another clinic, I just buy another laser. Yeah, so it, it, like you said, it depends where you're going. If it's not far, you know, we first started with our lunula laser in the UK, which is for uh, onychomycosis, nail infections, et cetera. And uh, one of our first clients used to, uh, they, they got a specifically developed sort of shopping trolley, used to put it in there, get on the tube from Radlett into uh, London, used to go to the Harley Street Clinic, uh, use it in there. So, you know, you can, they're built for durability. Uh, but again, look, we'll discuss this in a little bit more depth um, uh, with you, Ruby, if um, if this is a route you, that you're wanting to go down. A uh, message from Andrea, who has actually got a clinic up in Burnley. She's just, she's actually the first in the UK to purchase the Emerald laser, which is the only laser which is FDA cleared for up to 40 BMI on the overall body. Saying, very interesting, Rob. Can't wait to get up and running with our lasers. Um, Andrea also got an EBRL with the Emerald as well. So um, we're looking forward to, to getting out and seeing um, a lot of you. Um, you know, we, we very much, Aconia is a family run business. There are uh, five brothers that run the business. We try to run Europe, Middle East and Africa across here the same. Uh, we go a long way on relationships and, uh, and we hope to build some with a lot of you. So uh, Rob, unless there's anything else that you would like to add, uh, Ruby, I think you should have the um, contact details that the email came from. Uh, by all means, if you want to contact me direct, uh, it's sramshaw at aconiaeurope.com. So sramshaw at aconiaeurope.com. But you should have the um, the uh, the uh, email address. So, uh, Rob, thank you very much again. Everybody else, really appreciate your time. Uh, I know a lot of you will be wanting to get off to dinner, so we will stop talking. And uh, Rob, it's a week on Monday, I think, is, is part two. Yeah, the so 15th. We look, yeah, we look forward to seeing everybody then. Take Thanks, care. guys. All the best. Bye-bye.